First interview 2022. Welcome back to Money in the Tank. I'm Arnie and um, I'll hand you over to my co-host and then we'll introduce you to our very special guest to start off the year. G'day guys, Joel Siege, Principal Advisor, Harp LFG. Sorry for the delay in releasing podcasts or YouTubes for the last month. It was a bit bedlam leading up to Chrissy, so um, apologies for the for the delay there guys, but it's good to be back on deck and as Arnie mentioned before, tan slash red from uh, being outside a fair bit over the, the summer holidays. Yeah, looking good, mate. And we've got our very special guest, our old mate from high school. Cav, do you want to introduce yourself? Hey, guys, I'm Cav. <laughs> Chris Cavill. Um, yeah, nice to uh, be on the show, boys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us, mate. And this is a bit of an interesting one to start the year. And it's one which you suggested to me, and I love the idea. And it's basically the economics of being an artist. Because for those who don't know, everyone who knows Cav will know that he is a fantastic musician. But we're going to delve into well, a little bit about Cav being a musician, but then what goes into being an artist and the business side of things and how you manage it and, and sell yourself. So I'm excited to uh, delve into it. But before we get into it, I don't know if you've actually got it handy, Jolly, because I might be putting you on the spot here, but do you have Rivkin's rules with you? Mate, I um, I don't. And <laughs> that's because I'm at the office today. I don't have my I don't have my book handy, but what we could do is an ad lib. Um, You're gonna Google a Rivkin quote? Yeah. <laughs> do you know do you know Renee Rivkin, Cav? I don't. In so Renee mind. Yeah, Rene Rivkin, he's, he's passed away now, but he was a very famous Australian investor and he used to be on TV and he had like a weekly newsletter like back that used to come out in the post called you know, The Rivkin Report. I think it was called The Rivkin Report. And Jolie's got this book at home which says Rivkin's Rules and it's got a cover with him leaning back in like an open, open top convertible like with a big fat cigar out of his mouth. So we always start the show with a Rene Rivkin quote on life and investing. And I've yeah, got- cool. I've got one here. Usually they're a bit of a comedy segment, but this one's actually, I reckon, a good one to start the year off um, on a positive note, given all the craziness that we've just experienced. Uh, there's four quotes that have come up here. So the one of them I've pick, picked out is, I think one can achieve a very pleasant lifestyle by treating human beings and fellow human beings very well. So there we go. Start 2022 off on the right foot, everyone, and um, be kind to your fellow human beings, and uh, let's get, on, get on, onwards and upwards in life. I love that. I'll just uh, I'll close the window. We've got um, the dump truck coming past. Okay, no worries. No worries. Cut, we'll cut there quickly, and or maybe not. We'll just come back. But um, yeah. No, I, keep I, that in for sure. <laughs> Hold well on. Um, as a general uh, overview, I guess in the markets in general, Arnie, we did we sort of off the cuff. We didn't really discuss too much leading into it. It's I've sort of switched off over the break, but I know there's been a bit of volatility uh, in the markets and also the crypto world. So, well, yeah, I, I'm the same as you, mate. I haven't really been tracking it that much. I've been sort of just living life and enjoying Christmas yeah. and having parties and just trying to dodge COVID where I can. Had a few near misses, people who you know who we've hung around with tested yeah. positive. But I know in general, um, the Fed in America has recently said that they are looking to raise rates and raise rates sooner rather than later. So I think they've. I think they've touted March as a possible um, time to raise rates. And then there's also talk about QT as opposed to QE, so quantitative tightening and maybe removing, uh, maybe 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 shrinking the balance sheet a little bit for the, for the Federal Reserve in America. So, yeah, there was a few, uh, I guess there's a few events in recent weeks where comments like that have been made and we've seen reaction in the market. But in general... It's sort of status quo. I know one of my favorite stocks, one of our favorite stocks here at Money in the Tank is Tesla, and they recently reported um, massive, massive record delivery numbers, and then the stock jumped about 13%, but then in the weeks following that, it lost all of those gains and sort of back to where it was before those um, numbers were were released. So we'll see what happens with them on their next quarter earnings. I know that Obviously, if they've got record deliveries, it means they've got record sales. However, I know they've got a few big ticket liability items hitting the books as well. So there'll be some of the um, some of the the costs of the new Gigafactory ramp up will, will be hitting their books. So that'll bring some of their results down. And they've also got a few other things happening, but it escapes me at the moment because like you, I haven't been keeping up with it. So I don't think we Elon, should spend too long. Old mate Elon's increased his own personal balance sheet a bit by selling down some shares. Well, there was a big. Sorry to keep you waiting, Cad, but there was a big um, 
there was a big kerfuffle about that because there was an interview he did with the Babylon Bee. And if you guys are not familiar with Babylon Bee, it's a satirical news website, which he always retweets on Twitter. Like he likes that one. And they did an interview with him, a serious interview. And they asked him a, a range of questions about everything under the sun. But one of the questions was about him selling shares um, to, well, he had to, he had to sell to, to pay his taxes basically. Like I think you and I have covered it on previous pods, Jolly, but Long story short, he said he was done selling, but that was not technically true because he had a 10 5, a 10 B51 plan in place, which means he set it a while ago to automatically sell shares at certain intervals and dates. And then he came, so once he said on the interview that he was done selling, people bought up the shares and the stock price pumped. And then he sort of later on in the day said, oh, I meant it will be finished after that plan is finished. So there's still some to run. But people who were following it closely knew that he wasn't done because you can see it. It's all publicly available information. You can see when the shares will be sold. Um, so at that point in time when he said it, people who were in the know and were tracking it knew that he was only about 70% done. Uh, but I think he is done now. So, or maybe he's got a little bit more to go. But yeah, long story short, he's done um, selling the shares he needs to sell because of his options and his tax liability. So I think he is now the the largest single taxpayer in American history ever, mm. in, you know, from one person and definitely the largest in one year. Probably not a record you want to hold. I think he loves it because he's sick of them accusing him of not paying tax. He's like, you know, I don't, I don't earn income unless I sell shares. And so now that I've sold them, I've paid a big whopping chunk of tax and you can all shut up, but yep. the polis don't care. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess broadly as an overview from an economic standpoint, just keeping it brief before we get to CAV, um, uh, what we sort of expect for 22, some of the, the market updates we've been getting is, I guess, uh, the, the Omicron variant, the main kind of thought pattern is it'll be a, a speed hump rather than a full roadblock for the year. It'll be something that'll slow it down a touch. Um, but the countries that have strong vaccination uh, records and um, good healthcare sector should be able to get through this period and, and, and keep ticking along fairly well through 22. So um, they see a bit of inflation there that we've say, been saying all along that will be there for a, t- a while to come. Um, and maybe we, we might have some entrenched price um, prices that are a little bit higher here to stay, maybe not to the extent that um, it'll get to or it's gotten to in certain sectors of the economy like we've spoken about with building inputs, et cetera. Um, but we may, we may see, you know, higher for longer inflation, um, you know, not, not hugely but to an extent, and, and that'll obviously come out in the wash over time. Um, and as you can see, just everyone on the shelves at the moment, economically, uh, you see the supply chains being impacted and the supply demand issue with things. So it's just creating more emphasis on that. And um, that they're sort of the sorts of things, I guess, we see with shutdowns of areas or issues with COVID or people being off, um, just supply chain issues, which then has an impact um, on just everyday life of, of people as well. So um, that would be some interesting things to keep an eye on. And then just with the RBA as well, as you said before, with the um, the Fed, you know, looking to get the interest rates up a little bit. We'll see what the Reserve Bank of Australia does. Um, there's some pundits saying towards the end of this year, but um, probably most of the data we're reading is in 2023 for the first rate increase. But it will depend, mm-hmm. I think, a lot on what um, stems from other countries and, and how much um, the the inflation or the the pressure of growth uh, from other countries flows through to Australia. Um, and then we'll probably react from that. So, but the RBA have been steadfast saying, I think it's not till the end of 23, 24, they're, they're saying. Yeah. yeah, Phil Phil Lowe has said a couple of times, he doesn't care what date it happens. He wants all the economic indicators to be in the right spot. Yep. So I think maybe that's a good topic for next for next podcast is you and me can have a look at what's going on and do some predictions, some macro yeah. predictions. And then we'll probably and, get, try to get Brad on the next podcast because crypto's been nuts. So it's, yeah, crypto's been crazy and Brad's he's on holidays at the moment, which is why he's not with us. I might have to get this sign changed to say Joel, Chris, and Brad. Brad Tabot normally interviews with us, Cav, so. Um, I was say, I could probably provide you guys with some info and details on all that stuff that you were talking about. Like, I, I, I believe you could, sir. Well, without further ado, let's jump into it. And before we... <laughs> Before we do it, you can give us your Cavs 2022 macro market prediction. <laughs> Sorry, mate. I just, oh, I was lost. I, I had no idea what you were even talking about. <laughs> that's you, looked, awesome. you looked half interested, which is the main thing. Oh, that's good. <laughs> well, give, give us a, give us Cavs hot stock, not financial advice, just general in nature anyway. You can have uh, a think the about it. Stock, the only stock I've ever, um, financial stock I've ever 
sort of been connected with is Wes Farmers because I got given a whole bunch of shares when I worked there. Um, and I've still got them. Good stock to have. Good stock to hold. Yeah. All right. Well, without further ado, I wouldn't mind getting into the interview, but just just for the audience, maybe just and a bit of a plug as well. Um, you recently released an album, and it's available on definitely on Spotify. What other? It's called Lionheart. What other platforms is it available on for the Money in the Tank listeners to go have a a, a chill out and listen to, Cav? Yeah. So um, as you said, Spotify and all digital streaming services is definitely the easiest way to go and uh, uh, you know get a hold of it. Uh, other than that, jump on my website, chriscavillmusic.com, and you can order hard copy CDs and vinyls straight from there. I'll, I'll, I'll put that in the uh, Facebook post, so chriscavillmusic.com. Thanks, man. Um, so maybe just as a first step, I'll start off question, mate. Do you want to give us a background of yourself as an artist and, yeah. you know, if you can make it short, your, your musical journey to date and how you got to here? Um. I, I can't make anything short. Uh, <laughs> so I'll just um, I'll just sort of start with uh, sort of where it all began, and and I'll skip all the in between stuff and then just talk about where I am now. So um, so basically, I uh, I started playing music in high school. I was playing in um, a bunch of bands back then, and when I was in my early twenties, I. Uh, I really fell in love with um, acoustic roots music and I was inspired by people like Ben Harper and Jack Johnson and John Butler and all those people in the early 2000s. So I decided to um, start a, a solo career and and that's when, you know, it all sort of began for me around 2005, 2006. I recorded my first EP and seven records later, three albums, four EPs, uh, I'm still giving it a crack. I love that. And so, and the latest one is Lionheart. So, just tell us a little bit about the lead up to it. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Yeah, sure, mate. So, I um, I've sort of had a bit of a hiatus from from music uh, since my last release in 2016, and I, you know, for many reasons, I've had a family. Um, I'm a primary school teacher. And I was very invested in in that for a, a period of time, um, and yeah, I guess I kind of just I don't know stepped away for a bit. wasn't kind of um, feeling it or had the direction that I sort of needed to be pursuing um, my music. And then all of a sudden, when lockdown hit um, the first time in tw- in twenty twenty, I reconnected with some old songs that I wrote after my dad passed away in 2017 and uh, the plan was to do another record back then but I, um, I I walked away from it after a day in the studio, didn't feel like that the music and the songs were good enough to um, sort of uh, carry what I was trying to do. Um, which was a, an album that was dedicated to his life, my father's life. Um, so I just kind of put them on the back burner for a few years. And then with the lockdown, I picked up the guitar, had all this time that everyone else had and reconnected, but in a in a far greater way than I ever anticipated. Uh, I started writing a whole bunch of new music and um, playing music with my sons um and yeah just all of a sudden this this passion just reignited inside of me and and I'm, I'm still writing it so um last year 2021 was uh the the time for me to actually get in the studio recreate my brand uh get everything sort of going from a business perspective which I'd be happy to chat to you guys about um because the time away um, I really noticed that a lot of that was required to get back to where I wanted to be and and beyond that. So yeah, it's um it's been a it's been a really interesting journey the last two years with uh, with the album finally being released at the end of last year. And um, I must admit, from a personal perspective, mate, love love the new album. Love the, some of the songs on there. Just uh, thanks, Joey. I've got them saved as favourites, mate, so they get a regular rundown. Um, so, yeah, check check out uh, the Lionheart album. 
And the, the actual there's the song Lionheart on the Lionheart album, isn't it? That's the the Lionheart's the name of the album, and the song's Lionheart, yeah. Title track. Title track, which is which is my favourite. Title track. track, yeah. Yeah, it's, I love that track. It's awesome. Thanks, but mate. If we're going to throw out, he's going to pump up his tires a little bit. I think my favourite is Doing Time, which is the first song on the album. Like when that opened up, I had I had it on like like the speaker in the living room and my kids said, I got a little yeah. baby, 11 months old. She was loving it. Yeah. I was loving it. Great album. So Thank you, guys. You're welcome, yeah. mate. And much, much to relate to our 50-50 questions, Arnie, and I disagree straight away. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, we'll have to come up with a good one at the end here. But. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Cool, mate. Great, uh, great rundown. So, I guess in terms of um, you mentioned family and, and 2017, um, you tried and, and didn't quite work in terms of some of the stuff going on in your life to get back into the studio. And then 2020, 2021, it sort of resonated with you to, to get back in there. Does that? And, and I guess that leads us on to our next question: is, is tying that in with family? Is that sort of you know, did that help, I guess, give you that new creative mindset to, to, to strive forward with your music and, and have a new focus on things and then managing that with the balance of, you know, being the artist and doing the thing with the family and, and, and the career as well? So you say, are you asking, is the is my family uh, sort of like a, a leading inspiration behind Yeah, it? was that the new drive for you, for one? So as well that, as trying to balance. Was that the new drive and then how do you, how yeah. do you pull that because you're, career you know with music and then being a teacher as well and family i know you, you mentioned there that the kids sort of you know play along with you as well which is awesome to include so yeah tell us all those things yeah mate um i think you nailed it because a, a huge part of of uh of wanting to do this record but also to kind of um you know get myself back as a um as a you know, an active performing artist um, was, you know, definitely inspired by by my children and um, seeing them sort of display the um, the skills at a very young age. Um, you know, quite uh, you know effortlessly, sort of. You know, in a way. I know I'm biased because I'm I'm there. <laughs> dad and their parent and um i love them so much and you know i everything i see is gold um they've both got a real knack for it and jesse being the eldest uh he's a, he's a little bit more capable obviously because he's got two and a half years on levi um but the way that he is able to just pick up uh, music and connect with music and hear music you know, like he's already playing the ukulele and I think he's he's sort of mastered, you know, a dozen chords at least on that. And just today, they're on school holidays in the moment, just today I was uh, sitting with them, teaching them some things and Jesse's slowly transitioning to the guitar and he's starting to pick up your first sort of C, G, D chord and, and he just runs with it. Like it's, it's effortless. Um, and I think a couple of years ago, especially when the, the lockdown started, you know, I've, I haven't sort of put the guitar in the cupboard for five years. It's always been there and I've, I've pulled it out from time to time, but nowhere near to the extent that I have in the last 18 months. And uh, I remember just sitting there going, why aren't I doing this more? Like, you know, this is something that I've, loved for such a long time this is something that I've been heavily involved with in the past releasing albums touring and doing all this stuff and I'm just sitting there why am I not doing this more and I'm looking at my children and I'm going they need to have me around to be able to mentor them and show them um, so that they can flourish as 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 much as they possibly can and and I truly believe that if, if I wasn't as involved as what I am right now, neither would they be. And, and maybe they will be later on their own accord, but, you know, like to give them this time now, like every, uh, you know, I don't know what, what the saying is, but there's, you know, a certain amount of time before you hit a certain age where you pick up things so much quicker and easier and absorb things so much more than what you will when you're older. Mm. And 
And I hear of all these remarkable artists and when you hear their stories, they all started when they were a little kid, um, you know, and so that was a huge inspiration for me to, to make sure that, you know, I was giving them what I could see that they were so naturally gifted at. Um, but also on top of that, um, it was the, the need to be able to fulfil a dream of creating this record for dad, um, for myself, for my family, you know, for my mum um, and, and sharing that with the world. And, yeah, that was a, a big, it was a big change because of where I was um, as, a, as a teacher, as a, as a parent, as a dad, as you were saying, as someone who, you know, provides an income for the family. I was trying to cut you off, Kat, but that's what I wanted to ask no, you about as well. Because, oh, because you, were, you were touching okay, on it. I can't keep it short. No, no, you're good. I love it. Like, I love, I love hearing about it, but I, that's what it's I wanted to like, sort of, just Yeah, really. just, just to drill down on that part of it. So how are you managing it? Because, you know, you've got our lovely Rosie, your wife, and you, you're working as a teacher. So how are you two managing your normal careers and being a, a, a husband and a father whilst pursuing yeah. your dream and fulfilling, you know, and fulfilling that sort of that legacy to your dad. Like that's what I want to know as well, like how you've managed to juggle it because I'm sure that part would not have been easy. Yeah, it's not. It, yeah, it's definitely not. Um, it's all about finding a balance and it takes time. So, you know, going from a full-time teaching wage, um, which was around about 80,000. I mean, you can look it up on the internet. So I'm not shy of telling people that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we get the holidays. Yeah, that's the, that's the winner. That's your financial, um, <laughs> you know, reward there. Um, so, yeah, you know, going from, from that steady income down to what I make now, which, you know, is, is nowhere near that, but um, I, I still teach but in a casual capacity. So, you know, I'm able to, I'm able to bring in money um, for the family but also for my, uh, my business, which is my music, to be able to afford paying things, which we'll go into later. Um, and, and on top of that, also, you hope that the business is able to bring in money that is uh, sort of making up for the spendings that you've had during that time. So I guess to answer your question, uh, it's a balanced thing. You need to still, well, I feel like I still need to work. I don't just work because I need to make the cash because you can, you can make money, obviously, from performing full time. Mm. Um, but for me, I've still got, uh, you know, a, a drive inside of me to, to teach kids and to be involved with schools. Um, something I'm equally as passionate about, and so so still being involved in that you know in that casual capacity is really important to me. Um, but also as a way to yeah to support everything that we're doing. And and as you mentioned, Rosie before she's um, she's incredible. I couldn't do this without her, especially you know raising our family. But you know that's why um, great partnerships are so important. Um, because, you know, she's an outstanding nurse um, who's very, you know, exceptionally qualified in her area in, and, um, you know, she brings in the dollars too. It's 2022, man. We're, we're a, we're a dual-earning uh, family. I think we all are, right? Like you have to be that yeah. nowadays. But, yeah, that's awesome, man. Good stuff. Good insight as well because, yeah. I actually didn't know you. I didn't know that you had taken a step back in teaching, so that's, that's how you're managing it, you know what I mean? So you're doing the teaching and you've taken a bit of a step back and full time. I didn't realise when I asked you that, but that's cool. That's awesome. Yes. Well, I realised um, when I was, because uh, it, teaching, uh, having your own class is um, immensely, um, you know, um, involved. It, the load is just huge. Um, mm. You know, yes, we get our holidays, but... You know, you, you you just can't 
go, okay, well, I'm going to be creative 11 weeks of the year and for the other 41, I'll, I'll you know, make an income and, and, um, and, and have, have a job doing that and then I'll just set aside that 11 weeks to being creative. Creativity doesn't work that way. It just comes whenever it feels like it. So, mm. um, and, you know, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that, you know, is um, like it, it, you, you need to be experiencing different things. You can't just be in the same place every single day. That, yeah. that you know, nine to five going every single day doing the same sort of rotation of things and activities, even though every day is different, it's still kind of the same. Um, where, you know, getting out there and meeting new people and going to different places and doing all that kind of stuff, I think a lot of my creativity comes from there. So. And leading into the next question, Kev, um, in terms of moving on to the music side of things now and, and, and setting things up as you've done so, you know, 2020, 20, 2021, I guess the entrepreneurial qualities of whenever you're doing something or you're starting a business or you're, you know, you're getting running up and running, you're sort of, uh, you know, wearing many, many hats. So I guess what, what are some of the areas and the qualities you've been needing to do in terms of managing your own situation, your marketing, your socials? I see you're pretty active on socials so you can you can find Cav on all the, the big social areas and then sales, et cetera. So are you sort of trying to uh, wear all those hats at the moment? You, anyone helping you out? Um, how does all that work? Yeah, man. Um, it's... It's full on. It's it's like another full time job at times. Um, there's there's definitely busier periods than others. Around the release of the first single, the second single, and then the album, there was about a two to three week period where I was just flat out on the computer, and I'd I'd, I'd limit my shifts as a teacher in the in that time. Um, I'd, I found I was working, coming home, playing, spending some time with the kids, um, getting them sort of settled after dinner and then spending sort of eight till midnight or even one o'clock um, just behind a computer sorting out all that stuff. And that all so, even dramatically from when you last had your release, was it back in, in the 2010s you, when you had your last sort of big release? Yeah, uh, yeah so 2009 was the first album. Yeah. Um, and then I did a second album in 2015. So then is that changed? And it's a good question that you ask. Yeah. So from those in those three particular times there, um, 2009 to 2015 to 2021, six years on each, six-year gap in between them, the amount that the industry has changed in between that from the first point to now is extraordinary like it's it's just crazy how different it is um back in 2009 it was uh you know before spotify before digital streaming you were still reliant on radio and um like distribution in shops and all those kind of things um so it was it was harder than i think um it's easier now to get it out there, but there's definitely a bigger workload because it's endless how much you can do and, you know, it's just a matter of how much time you want to put into it and how big you want it to be. Um, so, yeah, to answer your first question, the things that I do that um, the business involves. So um, you've got uh, communication with venues for touring, You've got publicity. Um, so I have a publicist that works with me uh, that I hire and I hire her services for Australian radio and print media. Um, you've, I, this time I really invested in a designer because with the way that social mo media has moved um, these days and I, and I notice your nice little design there, Arnie, behind your face, your beautiful <laughs> face. Thank you. Um, you know, design is is critical, and it's it's very much um, a, a key to your brand. So you want to you want. I decided I wanted to invest the money into that, but also the time into creating what it was. 
Um, and, I, and I found a, a ripping bloke, and I'm going to drop his name, um, Kai at New Future Lane Design. Um, he's incredible and he's the most amazing person to work with and he made my life so much easier last year. Um, so big shout out to him. Um, uh, then there is yeah, your website creation uh, that I didn't do myself but I liaised with the, uh, with the designer. You've got the distribution label where you've got to upload all of your music. You've got to make sure that everything is perfect in terms of you know this like editing and all that kind of stuff listening through everything making sure that there's nothing that you know um goes uh unnoticed uh then you then you're dealing with manufacturers so you want to get everything right with the cd and the vinyl printing uh and of course on top of that you've got to make the album and that's (laughs) um a huge process you need to find a, a, a great producer, which I did in Damien Caffarella, um, work closely with them and, yeah, it took about the, the album itself, including recording times, print, um, mixing, mastering, um, listening. There's, there's at least a, a month there, 20 to 30 days involved. Yeah. Well, that, that kind of, that kind of like, yeah. it's a good segue into the next question because I was going to ask you about what goes into making the album. Um, and booking gigs and stuff, but you've given a yeah. good overview. So I guess as an extension of that, and so you're you're doing this all independently, Cav. Would you like ever consider going yeah. to a label, or do you like doing all this by yourself? I mean, obviously you're hiring help where you need the help for specialisations, but do you want to stay independent, yeah. or is your goal to get signed? Like, what do you want to do? It's a great question, man. Um, I've also got another good question after that. Too. I think it's a lot of very just remind me. Okay. Yeah, cool. Write it down. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, I already have short term I'll, memory I'll loss. when I wrote it down before, but I might think it's a good question. You guys might think it's crap. <laughs> All right, cool. I'm trying to keep the, the good question, Arnie. Good question, Joel, is equal so that, you know. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, tell us which question is better. That's fine. I mean, we know my questions are better. There's yeah. no, you don't, you, can, you don't have to, you know, take care of Joel's ego. We keep him in, in check here. <laughs> oh, good. Um, so, uh, I forgot what was the original question. I was, I was asking you whether or not you wanted to stay. Oh, yeah. Do I want a label or not? I'll be yeah. independent. Um, there's a lot of variables. Uh, so, it would be lovely for someone or a team of people to look after all that stuff that I just talked about before. Um, it would be awesome because the the consequence of that is that I get way more time to write music and I get way more time to record um, in a studio and develop and create and teach my boys and sit there and do all those, you know, amazing things that we all love doing as, as people, like just, you know, those those special things like you know whatever whatever it is that you're into where you just want to invest that time um you know whether it you know it's a hobby or whatever um the things you're passionate about that's what a label having a label involved would would do for me um whether it would be better financially whether it would be um whether it would whether it would give me the same purpose, I don't know because I can only comment on from the stories that I've heard from other musos and artists that I've you know met along the way that um, labels aren't always as cut out as what aren't always uh, what's the saying they're not always as uh, it's not always what you think it'll be or it's not what you think it'll be yeah something like that. Not, um, you know, there's there's sacrifices that I think you've got to make if if you are with a label. Um, I've spoken to people before about you know you know like can I like connect with someone? Is there anyone that you can recommend? Who? What do you think of these people? And I've had lots of people say to me, "Keep going independent, man, because you do a good job at it." And you know, it all comes down to what you want, um, and you know, you, you, you just got to be aware that when you're signed, like you are signed to what the people that are putting up the dollars want you to do. And, 
I don't know, man. I look. I think I'd like to experience it as something that I can say that I've done. Yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? I, yeah, I'm with you. You're happy going along, but if the opportunity presents itself, you're going to give it serious consideration. Yeah, that's right. Um, I like being an independent artist, but I, you know, I guess I can't really answer your question completely if I haven't experienced the other. Yeah. Um, here's my um, here's my follow up question. Yeah, go drop it to add on to that, um, <laughs> which is the better of the two questions. <laughs> so, with um, talk, talking about that side of things, and I guess what a label would do, or being independent, and and, and all that goes along with it, and promotion. Probably a two prong question is: How often have you given a thought over the past decade to ever going in one of these shows? like The Voice or Australia's Got Talent, to promote yourself as an individual artist. Um, yeah. I guess how close have you got over the years and would you, not to say, have you considered in the past, would you ever consider it in the future, but also what are some of the pros and cons you've heard of that goes along with being part of one of those shows? We've all seen them. People win it. Some go to superstardom and then some you don't really, you're like, oh, what have happened to that guy, you know? Um, yeah, so tell us a bit about, about yeah. that if you know much in that area, Chris. Um, well, when people... Oh, it's a great question too, Jolie. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, actually is, it actually is a good question. I got it. It's better than my question. I concede. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I like you. Aren't people have asked me that plenty of times over the journey and I... I, I've I've quickly said nah nah no way you know I've always said nah I wouldn't do it never thought about it or whatever I I have thought about it before like you know I it, it's crossed my mind I've never really considered it very seriously though I've never put in an application um I don't know there's just so much kind of so uh, yeah there's a lot of pros and cons to it. So, you give know, us, that's give part. us one of the main pros, one of the main cons of doing a show well, like that. It's the exposure. It's that it's that instant exposure to be able to go, all right, this is who I am, this is what I do, this is what I sound like. Um, you know, where can this take me? Um, can I boost my following, you know, dramatically overnight? Yes, I can. Um, like a quick, like a quick sugar hit. Well, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, and you know, like, like I, I thought. Well, imagine I I got on on one of those shows and and sung Lionheart on stage, um, because I probably wouldn't sing anything else at this present time. Um, and if I didn't get the reception that I have got from the people that have organically been there, I think it would affect me. I, th yeah. I, th I definitely think that it would uh, impact me in, in a certain way, in a negative way. Um, and I don't think I need that. Mm. And, you know, like this song, this song is so special. Mm. Um, in so many ways, in, in so many ways that I think when you put yourself in that situation, you're somewhat asking for it, if that makes sense. Oh, great answer to a great question, mate. Um, I guess yeah. more, more broadly, have you had any experience of other artists that they've had negative experiences apart from maybe the song not resonating on stage but just more so through the journey or after the fact of being on one of those shows? Is there any stigma attached to it? Is there any kind of negative fallout from being on a show like that that they've experienced that you know of? So I've definitely, I've definitely met people before that have either been on the show or I've known them before the shows. Um, and I haven't necessarily had any um, so specific conversations around what you're asking, 
But from what I've kind of perceived is that it's like, you know, it's been a bit of a sugar hit, like what you said before, for some. Um, others have had the experience that I was ex- trying to explain before where they've gone on, they've poured their heart out, they've, um, you know, sort of given their all, given their soul, um, and it hasn't gone the way that they'd wanted it to go. And I won't name any names. Um, there was a, a country singer that was on The Voice a few seasons ago, outstanding performer, incredible vocalist, um, you know, remarkable talent. She's, she's yeah, she's, she's known within the local scene as someone who's, who's very special and very good. And I just remember seeing her on that stage when they used to do the battling against each other mm. and she just looked uncomfortable and it didn't look like, you know, she was enjoying it. Um, it. It just didn't look like the right thing for her. And, it, you know, the, the, the judges didn't, it wasn't received. Like she wasn't the, the, the fan favourites because she wasn't what the judges and the show wanted. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's to make, you know, the next pop star that is going to just be a yes person and, and do mm-hmm. everything that you want the them to. The environment for her wasn't conducive to what her artistry is all about. Um, in that <laughs> circumstance. So she made it through the first bit and then that second stage was yeah. never going to be conducive to what she does and, and her artistry. And, yeah, okay, yep. no, that's a great answer, mate. Thanks for, yeah. um, thanks no, for letting us through yeah. that. I thought the audience might be interested. That's okay. And, then, and just to add on to that, the last season, which I didn't really, I mean, I do watch the show. My boys love watching it. Um, and, you know, there's, you know, you get some some good singers that go through there, of course. And... You know, there was this one bloke, a lawnmower guy, and I remember one of the judges gave him an Avril Lavigne song to sing, and <laughs> I was just like, "Are you serious? Like, this is a this is a bloke from the suburbs that you could you could picture playing in the corner of a of a of a bar or a pub or or whatever. You know, like, let's channel sort of '80s kind of cold chisel and hunters and collectors and all that kind of stuff. And you're standing up there singing Avril Lavigne. Come on. Like difficult. It's ask. just it's a it's a bit of a joke when I it comes like to that. Music selection is very much kind of uh stuff or Adam Av- Avril Lavigne's kind of a hit from back in maybe 10 years ago. But a lot of the stuff yeah. is modern kind of music now that they want to appeal to the masses that's on the radio or getting airplay that may not even come close to suiting the artist that as you mentioned like I've I've watched the show and I've been waiting to hear like I don't know like a John Mayer song or, or something like that come on but they just yeah. do it yeah. which is a shame it's it's a it's a shame for the artist I, to show you know in their wheelhouse what they love doing yeah and I definitely feel like that there would be some conversations behind the scenes where artists have gone in they say I'm really passionate about this performer or this person or whatever i really feel this song and they go no nah, mate no nah, it's not gonna happen yeah. and yeah i don't know i just for me i kind of go with music they say you've got to connect to it and how are you supposed to connect to someone that you've got no want to ever perform you know or cover like you don't have any attack okay. exactly yeah cool mate. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of an interesting thought experiment though too like i'm like obviously not familiar with the bloke you're talking about, but this this lawnmower bloke who's more suited to cold chisel. Imagine if he adapted like Skater Boy into like a cold chisel style. You know, it gives them an opportunity to showcase talent. I think that's why they would do it. But at the same time, I hear what you're saying. Like it's horses for courses, and sometimes you're just not suited to a particular song or or, or brand yeah. of music. Oh, look, mate. There's no doubt that you can tweak songs in that way um, because it's been it's been done many times before. Um, but there's a level of kind of um, artistry and talent that goes along with that, I think, and it's not something mm. that you can just manufacture in a you know in a lab. I agree. Yeah, it comes from the heart, mate. Bit of a bit of a gear change, Cav. What yep. are the um what are like what's the economics around the streaming platforms for artists and how like the royalties work? You don't have to name like figures and sums, but like how how you set it up. Like so, with Spotify, 
with YouTube, if you're going to list merch under your songs, I know some artists put like merchandise under their songs or any yep. other stream platform. How does that side work? And is it a generous cut for the artist or do they gouge the artist? Like, is it better in that sense? Because like, it, it sort of sprung to mind earlier when you were saying it's different to, you know, 2009 when everything was, you were relying on distributors. Now you could yeah. do it all yourself. Yeah. Um, it's a great question, Arnie. <laughs> Jolie, I'm one up now, mate. I'm one up. Start thinking, Joel. Get that pen going. It's even now. It's even. Okay, it's even. We'll go back and listen um, to the tape. <laughs> so, you know, it's something I'm, you know, thank you. I appreciate you saying you don't have to mention figures and all that kind of stuff, but I'm really open about it and I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about it and so I'm happy to talk about whatever because it's not something that I feel like I need to be um, keeping confidential at this stage. Um, so the, the, the finances behind being a musician are, are really fascinating and really interesting because I think that it's one of those industries, I'm sure there's others out there, that I don't think there's a lot of real understanding of what actually does happen. And um, I think that sometimes there is this perception that you earn heaps of money um, but then I think there's also another perception that people pe- people know that the music industry is full of poor people that basically, you know, struggle to be to be able to provide themselves with a, an income like you would from a, a regular job. Um, and it's a bit of both. It's a bit of both. So it, it all depends on on your level of success, the decisions you make. Um, how much you put in, how much you take out. I mean, probably like any any business. Um, so to start, I guess uh, I guess if you want to look at how you would make income, and then I can sort of measure that to how much you spend. Does that make yeah, sense? Is that yeah, okay? of course. Is that a nice, all right way to approach it with with streams and you know making money as a musician. Um, you know, it's it's not as uh, it, it's not as sort of um, fruitful as what you would sort of think or hope. But I, you know, I think that it is also known to the general public that it you don't get paid that much because people do often come up to me and they say, "Oh, yeah, you're getting your you know zero point zero 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 one cent or whatever." Um, but I've got it written down here just to give your listeners a. a a good idea of what the actual figures are. So Spotify will pay anywhere between 0.002 and 0.003 cents for every stream that you have. And a stream is classified as a 30-second play. Um, So to give that a little bit more of um, an understanding, a better perspective, every 100 plays you'll make yourself 30 cents. <laughs> yes. Um, I've, I've made you about 30 cents off my uh, 100 listeners. Oh, to art. Thanks, man. I, <laughs> you can buy me a soft serve cone next time. We're at the <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're a bit yeah, I, was, I was a bit afraid of talking about this on your show because isn't your show around sort of making money? No. <laughs> Well, it's about it's about it's about being an entrepreneur, and I feel like yeah. the artist's perspective is a brilliant one because I feel like most the majority of people, in some way, shape, or form, myself included, have creative aspirations, yeah. and I love hearing about how you're monetizing it because it's the, it's it's the reality of the situation. Like, if you're going to go out on your own, you're going to start off small. If you're independent, and then you hope to build a base, and it's it's refreshing to hear someone talk about it in real terms, Kath. It really Thanks, is. man. And it's refreshing to hear yourself say, you know, those things. So thank you. Um, Streaming is such a big part of it nowadays. So, you know. It's, it's huge, mate. And, you know, as I said, to, to put it into perspective, you've got 100 plays, you've got 30 cents. 1,000 plays, you've got $3. 10,000 plays, you've got $30. 100,000, you've got 300. A million, you're looking at three grand. All right. So. It's not unheard of for a local artist to get a million plays. It's not unheard of for a local artist to get 10 million plays these days. And and you've got to think that's globally as well. So that's going to places that you could never have imagined of reaching. Um, At one point, half of my audience was in Brazil. 
and you know, I was I was going, yeah, I could go to Brazil for a bit of a uh, a holiday and a tour. That'd be awesome. But on top of the you know um, the joy of doing something like that, there's also that sort of feeling of hey, I've got people on the other side of the world in a different language listening to my music. Like, it's a really cool thing. Um, you know, so I, I I do know guys that have had 10 million um, streams and, if you you know, if you're looking at three grand times 10, um, you know, you've got $30,000 perhaps coming in from that one song, which, you know, it's not a huge amount of money. And definitely doesn't make up for all the time and and um, money that you've put into this your whole career, but it is something. Um, but you also got to remember that streams means tickets to shows. It means people through the door. The more people that are listening to you, the more people that want to come and and see your shows. And that's um, it. Like that's it. Like to wrap it up because we're. Yeah. we're- but yeah, I hear what you're saying. It's like you're putting yourself out there. It's almost self marketing and self promotion, and then you can yeah. sell your, your your hard copy products and get people into touring and stuff. Yeah. So so far with Lionheart, I've had just over twenty thousand, and this is just the song, um, not the album, but the songs had just over twenty thousand streams, which is my highest by far to date, and I'm incredibly proud of that. Um, so it's made me sixty bucks. That's you awesome. Know? Like wow, like. Yeah, like, you know. I love it. That's sick, man. But, you know, it, as it's a means to an end. Um, it, it's a it's a door, for, it, it, you know, for opportunity. Um, you know, we don't do it for that. Uh, you know, for me, it's about my, my purpose in life, um, being able to fulfil those things we talked about at the start of the interview. Um, and But hopefully being able to finance it completely one day and to be able to maybe have that time to be able to work on my creative side um, whilst being paid for it. Um, the dream, isn't it? it I know. It dream, man. Uh, joel has got a social engagement he needs to shoot off to soon. So, yeah, Cav, yeah. just just very quickly, is there anything we've forgotten to ask you that you think, you know, budding artists, entrepreneurs need to know? And then we'll slide into our favourite segment, which is quick Q&A and 50-50, which is where we, uh, we ask you a question about personal choices yeah sure um cut there and i'll have a think about it just give me a oh, second right. i don't even cut off the question you haven't promoted yep. your tour dates coming up so where where can we find you coming up cab over 2022 the uh is it the omicron tour or what's it called? <laughs> i like the name of that man that's i hadn't thought of that it's good um it, i really hope that it's not um, I'm a little bit nervous about it, to be honest. Uh, you'll be right. Um, positive vibe. Uh, yeah, no, that's it. I am a positive guy, uh, but I can't help it. You know, I'm a realist as well. So uh, I am a little bit nervous, um, but I'm, I'm still holding out, hoping that everything's going to go ahead. Starts at the Wesley M, which is the fifth reschedule from um, last year. I've got three shows there, February 18, 19, 20. And then I'm going to Regional Vic and then at the start of March I'm heading up the coast with the family and we're doing a month between Sydney and Sunshine Coast. So get awesome. um, all your dates up on the socials as well. Yeah, they're all up there. Go and check them out. Come and see us live because um, there's only so far that the $60 can get. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> you get better than point zero zero three on your ticket sales. Yes, very much so. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. You know, come and see us live because I just want to connect with these songs and the people there, and and just bring everything together. And um, yeah, I you know that's also what I uh, what I live for. So it would be it. awesome to be there, be able to yeah play for you. Oh, thanks, Cav. Yeah, we'll, we'll quickly. This is the end end of the segment. What we'll do is. Um, Joey's going to hit us with a, a listener Q and A, and then we're going to give you and ourselves a 50-50 or a watch a choice where we give you a choice between two things, and you have to tell us what you prefer, and we will also tell you what we prefer. And it's just to highlight that everyone makes different choices in life as Is they it do. Like to do with the savory shapes thing, like yeah, yeah, that was that was a previous one, you know. Yeah, yeah. I like I like savory shapes. They're one my, of my, my my man. I knew yeah. Hey, hell yeah. yeah. What up? That's right. Cav. So. Serial killer top, serial killer top stuff. That. 
<laughs> so what's the, what's the what's the listener Q and A, Jolly? We've got yeah, so from uh, from our uh, our listener Kenny, who's a great friend of the podcast. Uh, Shout out, of, Kenny. Uh, yeah, one of the one of the, the, the big listeners. So sorry for the delay of releasing this one, Kenny, because you asked me literally about a month and a half ago. Um, but BrickX. So what do we know about BrickX? What have we heard about it? Um, I said it was a good question because I, I I'd heard about it many many years ago, but I haven't seen a heap heap of it um, since I heard about it all those years ago. But um, uh, essentially, it's 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 buying properties or a portion of properties where you don't have to buy the whole shebang. So, um, as an example, if uh, you they, they split them in ten thousand portions or bricks. So if you buy if there's a property worth eight hundred thousand and it's bulk purchasing, so they, they buy the property and they split all the bricks up. Each brick's valued at $80, and you can buy as, as many bricks or as little bricks as you want to buy. When you say $80, like the, the, the price of the brick would change based on the price of the valuation of the home that's been bought, I'm assuming, yeah. right? Yeah, like a residential home. So, you know, if the residential home of 800000 goes up in value by 10% for the year, so it's 880 then mm-hmm. you've got your, you know, your $88 per brick. Um, at the end of the year, and then you'll pick up rental yield. And if you choose to sell out, I, I believe over that period you'll be able to um, to to take the the sale proceeds of the brick. And there's obviously someone that needs to buy the bricks from you. Um, there are performance costs, I believe, and transaction fees and whatnot. So just check out their website. There's a fair bit of information on there. This is always general in nature, so we don't suggest to buy or not buy. But it's just a general overview on what BrickX is. Um, mm. Some of the pros and cons, I guess. Uh, in terms of it's it's fairly low cost from what I can see, smaller commitment, which is probably the, the big thing, and flexibility, um, and can be easy to sell or buy, whereas buying a whole home, you you can't sell a room, you've got to sell the whole thing or nothing at all. Um, I guess some of the cons is you don't have the flexibility like you do with your, if you bought your own property. Like I know Cab's property there, um, you've done a lot of renovation work to it, so you wouldn't be able to do that um, with the BrickX Brick property. So um, and, and BrickX property, or BrickX buys the property, so you, you can't choose your own where you, you know, that you want to buy yourself. Um, and uh, I think it says on here, limited properties available to invest in um, and risk of vacant properties or no rental income, which is a risk with all property anyway. All rental, all rental investing. It's an interesting question, Kenny, and I have heard about this before and I've heard about other competitors, Jolin. I know, I forget off the top of my head, I forget the names of them, but I know BrickX is not the only one. I think it's the most popular. And I think you're right. I think the minimum you can invest in BrickX to start getting rental yield is 50 bucks. Don't quote me. We don't fact check on money in the tank, but it's roughly around that. So uh, it's an interesting look into getting started in property investing and it's a low risk way. But I would say that if you are thinking about this and it's general in nature, do go and look at the fees they charge on the rental yield that you get per your fractional ownership. And I would also say, look at how they treat capital growth because when you sell your bricks, I'm wondering how they factor that part in because that's obviously yeah. a big benefit to being your own property investor is you get the benefit of all the capital growth. I wonder if the company takes all or a fair chunk of that. Yeah, yeah, check all those things out. It looks like there's an establishment fee of 10 bucks plus a minimum 240 investment, so you're pretty close. Um, and the investment, the amount of cost of bricks can vary. Transaction fees, a percentage of the purchase, the price of the bricks, uh, and then a fee for the sale as well. So half a percent on the fee sale as well. So yeah, check all those things out. Some other high level thoughts. I haven't delved into it too heavily, but you know what happens if you're wanting to leverage into property? You know you mm. probably leverage to get into BrickX, but you know you're better off just leveraging in your own name or a uh, trust name, um, and then using that equity to be able to leverage again. Um, that probably that's a question, I guess. Um, and then, yeah, you know, the ability to be able to subdivide it or whatnot, you probably lose that, um, I guess, ownership side of things as well. So there's just a little thought for you, Kenny. But yeah, great question. And just quickly, Jolly, are these bought? These aren't bought on exchanges, right? Like this would just be managed through like the website of the company. Yeah, I reckon it's. I think it's through a. Um, uh, like a managed fund or REIT, uh, it looks like. I don't think it's... Um... But it's not a REIT that's publicly available because that's what my first thought was when you said this was, if I wanted exposure to real estate, how does this differentiate from a yeah, REIT, so which is a real estate investment through, trust? It's registered through ASIC as a managed investment scheme. So they it's subject to regular requirements and oversight. Okay. So, yeah. That's, that's promising for investors then if it's subject to ASIC regulation. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's all legit. But um, it's just what, what's personal preference and what's suitable and... General in nature, as always, when we're discussing these topics. So seek personal advice and guidance for your own situation. But now, our, fa- our favourite segment. Love questions 
keep bringing them in um, and all different channels. You can ask them on YouTube or our socials or whatnot or PAMIS. We'll, uh, we'll always try to get back to the good questions. Um, so we love them. Keep them coming. Oh, well, that's, our, that's, the, that's my 2022 resolution is get better at engagement on socials. So, yeah, hit us up on Money in the Tank, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. The only one we're really active on is Facebook, but I'm, I'm well, actually obviously we load the videos on YouTube, but I'm going to make sure that the Instagram and the Twitter are more active this year. So, yeah. But, yeah, our favourite segment, 50-50, what's your choice, gun to your head, either or, this or that. I think, I, I think I've nailed them there. So we've got a listener submitted 50-50 for Cav this week. No, it's not not listener submitted. It's actually uh, what, did, uh, what did I think of before for a 50-50, which is a good one, which ties in with um, the current weather we're experiencing. Okay. So um, the 50-50 for this week, which uh, ties in with financial loosely because everything's got choice in life, choice of brick X, for example, or buying your own property. That's a choice. <laughs> what do we have with a choice? I guess we have to probably limit it to where we live, which is Melbourne. But I guess generally, if you wanted to choose, would you prefer a spa or a pool? Um, if you had the choice to put one or the other in at your home, what would you choose, spa or pool? Are you going to make Cab go first? Yeah. Pressure's on, man. Do you want a short answer or a long answer? <laughs> uh, Whatever you're feeling. Your version of your version of long would be worrying, so let's go with short-ish. And you've... And it looks like <laughs> you've frozen up on our screen too, Kev. Uh, am I on? Yeah, you're on. Yep. Okay. All right. I would prefer a pool. Do you want to know why? Love yeah, give, give us a shortish why, yeah. Because uh, there's something about just, um, you know, swimming underwater that I just, I don't know. I just feel like whenever I'm doing it, it just makes me feel old. So yeah, as corny as that is, I would prefer a pool. But I love that. I would never put a pool in at my place because I've got too many damn leaves, too many damn trees. Right? <laughs> and I grew up with a pool on a property that had heaps of gum trees that had the leaves fall, and all you do is clean it. Yeah, nightmare so, to clean. Nightmare. Yeah, to good but, consideration. But not interested. I, I would definitely go with the pool, Jolly, because I feel like we just don't have enough uh, weather that is accommodating of a spa where I feel like during the hot months of the year, which you're only going to get more and more and more, um, I want I want the relief of a pool. And, you know, thinking about my backyard, there is some leaf litter, but it's not unmanageable, Cav. So, yeah, I, I go with the pool. Good. Yeah, yeah love it. Um, I reckon we're still at the beach. We're, we're a three tie here because uh, I um, I'm a big pool guy as well. Hate cleaning it, hate the maintenance of it. Got a pool myself. Um, spend a lot of time during the year looking after it, but um, it pays dividends uh, when you you know you're coming in these hot months, December, January, February, uh, and the kids being the age they are, just in it every day. And I don't reckon if we had a spa, we'd be in it as much as we are consistently over the summer period. Yeah, I, and I heard Cav throwing the curveball there. What about going to the beach? I love a beach day, but I feel like the convenience of a pool would still beat that. So if I had to choose, you know, go to the beach or go to the pool, I mean, obviously I would choose the beach if I'm choosing, but, like, in terms of how much use it would get, the pool would win hands down. What if you lived at a beach? Oh, if I lived at a beach, I wouldn't bother buying a pool. Then I'd actually go for the spa because you could just go in the ocean, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I what if you guys. lived... What if you lived within 20 minutes of a beach? I'd still go for the spa. <laughs> I don't mind a 20-minute. Are we talking about a 20-minute walk or a 20-minute drive? Drive. Yeah, I'd still probably go for the spa. <laughs> 40 minutes? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, guys. Thanks, Heaps, for today. Uh, Kat, right. it's a pleasure having you on. Arnie, great to see you again. Uh, glad all is well. And thanks for our listeners for tuning in. And we will uh, endeavour to not have such a big break uh, as we just did over the Christmas period, but uh, we'll we'll try to be regular this year, and we look forward to having you on the, on board on the journey of uh, the podcast and chatting about all different fun topics each week. So thanks again for coming on, Cap. Yeah, cheers, mate. Thanks for having me, guys, and stream hard. <laughs> I love that. Yes, go give Cav's uh, album Lion Hard a listen. Money in the tank. Cheers, boys. Cheers, bro.
flying high.